Welcome in to another episode of the Dog Check Podcast, part of the Believe Network of Podcasts, and also airing weekly on Bally Sports Cleveland. I'm Spencer German in Cleveland. Training camp is about a week away now. We're, we're so, so close. We can almost taste it. And here to get us one week closer to Brown's training camp is Lindsey Rhodes, formerly of the NFL Network, now host of the Believe Fantasy Football Show. Lindsey, Thanks for stopping by the dog check this week to talk a little Browns. And I promise you, we're going to work in a little bit of fantasy into this conversation as well. Let's do it. I'm ready. Um, okay, so I'll start with, it's it's a, it can be a touchy subject. I understand that. But I feel like every guest I've had on throughout the offseason, we kind of get a lay of the land on where they stand with Deshaun Watson in terms of how they mm-hmm. think he's going to perform in 2023. because Or 2024, excuse me. Because Browns fans remain hopeful that the quarterback that the Browns traded for three first round picks and all that is still in there. But there's the other side of this where it's like, well, Hey, he hasn't played up to that level of a, to being a top five quarterback in the game in four years. What are you sort of expecting from Deshaun Watson on the football field this year? The, I mean, the, the honest question is, I don't know. Uh, because it's been so inconsistent since he came to Cleveland. And it's been so long since we've seen Deshaun Watson be the guy that we know he can be, that is in the higher range of outcomes. It's just been a long time. And there have been like sporadic bursts of that guy, kind of, that have shown up a little bit in Cleveland here and there, but, but not consistently. And so I don't know. And, and because of the inconsistency of being on the field and, uh, you know, being in the same offense and working with the same weapons and like, it's just, he's one of the most difficult predictions I think to make at the quarterback position this year, because the range of outcomes feels so wide and wider than, than I think i I feel like is true for most quarterbacks. I think he could yeah. be, if he's the guy we saw in Houston, that was so long ago. That was so long ago, Spencer. <laughs> so, but if he's it that was. guy for some reason with any kind of consistency, then this off and I'm it. And the, the range of outcomes is not just wide for him. It's for the Browns. Like, because the Browns are going to go as he goes, you know, unless, I mean, and if he gets hurt, obviously it worked out last year and you went and found a pretty good backup quarterback down the stretch. And that, that worked out. So I, I don't know. I just think that the Browns are one of the toughest teams to predict yeah. in a tough division because the quarterback is just, I, I have no idea what to expect from him. I'm sorry. Well, <laughs> That's I, not I, a I more think, like no, you're, specifically you're, it, narrowed down. <laughs> no, but listen, I, I think your answer does speak to just the general feeling around this team on a national level, on a local level. Um, obviously like inside that building, the team still believes in him and they make that very clear, but you know, fans, I think are nervous as hell. Like they don't know what what to, what to expect this year. And you're right. Like 2020 was a long time ago. I mean, that was, that was the pandemic year. Like we're, we're well past that at this point. And so it's hard to really project. So I, I do think like your answer just speaks to the questions that loom large over this team. And I've been saying the same thing. Others have been saying the same thing. This team this year has the talent to be really, really good, maybe even a Super Bowl contender, but it all kind of hinges on Deshaun and his play. I, I want to play you this clip here because Wyatt Teller joined uh, Tyler Dunn, who's covered the NFL for quite a long time. He has his own website, the uh, the Go, Go Long um, with Ty Dunn. Oh, yeah. And he had Wyatt Teller on his the, the podcast and did a little story about him afterwards as well. And he talked about an ar- a range of topics, but specifically I want to play this clip. He talked about what he has seen, why I tell her that is, from Deshaun Watson. I mean, a pretty uh, bold comparison. We'll we'll play this and we'll react on the other side. I would love to say, you know, he he has glimpses of Patty Mahomes. uh, Patty Patty Mahomes is once-in-a-lifetime guy. I mean, he's he's insane, and he has great outlets. He has great receivers. He has a great defense. He has all these different things around him to make him better, but he is the truth. I believe that Deshaun has that. I, I truly do. I've seen glimpses of it, you know, putting a whole game together. I mean, it, it's tough putting a whole season together, putting a whole stretch together. Um, it's fucking hard, man. Um, I couldn't imagine taking two years off of football and expecting to play at the same level I was playing at, um, 2020 and then 2021. So I just, I, uh, I'm, he's the helm of my, of my team. I pray that he has an unbelievable season and honestly, Plays out of his out of his mind, not not to win a Super Bowl, but just for himself. Um, 
so it, 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 I think it's funny at the end of that clip, he says, you know, he's the helm of our team. So it's, it's one of those things where you're like, well, what else is, is Wyatt Teller, who's up front blocking for Deshaun Watson, right. going to say? But at the same yep. time, um, you know, I, listen, I, I think people would generally would say that back in 2020, like we alluded to, Deshaun Watson was on that level with Patrick Mahomes. But four years later, again, it's it's such an uncertainty. Just what were your thoughts hearing Wyatt Teller talk about that a little bit? Because he even used what you said, like in glimpses, we have seen right. some of that. I think um, when I listen to that, I kind of, I, I dismiss that largely as, you know, in my experience in the media asking about quarterbacks, you're always going to get somebody who says that they, I mean, a teammate's always going to say that yeah. they believe in them and they're always going to say something, I mean, certainly positive and optimistic. And, you know, I just, I don't know what else he's supposed to say. And that's the thing <laughs> that you always want to keep in mind when you're asking or listening to those questions is like, what, what is being volunteered that they didn't have to volunteer that's specific? Right. Like those are the kinds of things that I'm listening for just as a media member. And in my time in the media, it's like, okay, yeah. that you, you couldn't not say that, you know, oh, but you didn't have to say that. That's interesting. So those sorts of things are the things like at this time of year, I'm looking for volunteered information we're not asking about. Right. So like, like that was how I totally, um, outside the Cleveland Browns, like that's how I, I, I found myself onto Puka Nakua last year at this time of year because people were volunteering out of Rams camp information about Puka. Nobody's asking about Puka. They were like, hey, you have a fifth round wide receiver. Tell me all about him. People were like asking about other people and people are volunteering like, but we've also got this guy Puka and he's running with the ones. And like, so those sorts of things are the things that I'm most interested in hearing about at this time of year things that are being volunteered that people aren't asking about. And unfortunately where a guy like Deshaun Watson is concerned, nobody's not going to ask. So <laughs> it's so yeah. hard to know what people really think and what people are just optimistically and supportively saying, because that's your teammate and you have to say that, right? Like we watch hard yeah. knocks every year and you, you see people gas people up because you have to believe at this time of year that every team has a chance to go to the Super Bowl, even if they don't. And every team has every player has a chance to be the best version of themselves, even though we typically don't see everybody check that box. Um, so I don't, I don't really. It, it's not that I don't think that that's true. I just don't necessarily think that him saying that means anything. That's very fair. Um, and I, I think like you're right. Everyone, everyone's going to ask everybody on the Browns, around the Browns. I'm in those those media rooms, like about Deshaun Watson. So of course the answers are largely going to be positive from the team that's paying him and expects big things from him. So I, th I think that's a really good way to look at it. And um, yeah, I just thought, you know, always interesting to hear different comps and things like that. But when it comes from the team, you got to sort of understand where it's coming from or who the messenger is. Uh, we'll stick with quarterbacks here for a second, but more broadly, mm -hmm. I, I'm going to work in a fantasy football question here. Um, okay, where I think it's interesting because in fantasy, sometimes the best quarterback in the league isn't always the best quarterback in fantasy in the league. Right. What are your like top five quarterbacks from a fantasy standpoint that people should be paying attention to and considering drafting this year? Well, the quarterbacks this year that are coming By off the board. By the way, the board, I'm, ass I'm assuming Deshaun's not on it after this conversation. He's not. In fact, Deshaun, <laughs> if, look, and this is also, this is interesting. We're talking to a Browns audience here, right? Yeah. If you are in on what Wyatt Teller is saying, and you think that that's the Deshaun Watson we're going to see this year, and you think that this is a team that's going to make a Super Bowl run, and that you're, I mean, that the only concern for Deshaun Watson is health related. Can he stay on the field? If that's what you think, you're going to love fantasy drafting this year because the amount of value that you're going to be able to build mm. around the Browns offense is massive. Um, Deshaun Watson is going in so in ffc drafts uh for people who are not nerds like me it's like these are the high stakes drafters so this is not necessarily where you in your home league with your buddies if that's the only fantasy league that you play this is not where people are going to go necessarily these are like sharps right so it that kind of changes the the positioning a little bit but in those drafts you can get to sean watson in round 13 and the for comp purposes the first quarterback coming off the board is josh allen in the third round so you're getting um and i don't actually have the number in front of me but i'm gonna say he's probably like 
QB 15, Mm. somewhere in that range, like the ones around him in this particular format um, or not format, but uh, ADPs is Kirk Cousins is going in the 11th. And then you've got Deshaun Watson in the 13th, followed by Aaron Rodgers, followed by Baker Mayfield, followed by Geno Smith. Like that's the tier that you're looking at with Deshaun Watson. It's not the upper tier of quarterbacks where you maybe would have looked at him if he had been healthier, more consistent for the last few years. Certainly a handful of years ago, you're looking getting Deshaun Watson much further up the board. So if you're a fan of Deshaun Watson, you think that this is going to hit this year, then congratulations, because you're going to, if you're right, you're going to build a monster fantasy squad because yeah. you can wait and get him so late and be totally fine in terms of the the value that you're getting at other positions. Um, but the the top quarterbacks that are going this year, it's Josh Allen is the number one quarterback coming off the board. And then you're seeing Jalen Hurts uh, largely because of the rushing right. upside, right? right? Like you're going to see a trend there. Patrick Mahomes, people, it, yeah, that was a letdown last year from a fantasy standpoint. He did not have a good fantasy year. I think that people are banking on the fact that that – he's Patrick Mahomes and that they have kind of uh, added some pieces to the wide receiver room, got a little bit more experienced at that position. Who knows what Rashi Rice's situation is going to be. Is he going to be suspended or not? But like, it feels like they have maybe a few more pieces there. And so people are banking on Patrick Mahomes again. And then it's Lamar Jackson. Now, like the fifth guy is kind of interesting. I think it's, I think it's uh, by and large going to be CJ Stroud. People are in on Mm. CJ Stroud. He's going very high this year. And then you're going to like the Anthony Richardson and the rushing upside and the fact that he pops so high because when he did play last year, which was infrequently, unfortunately, you got to see like he has QB one potential. Like this is a guy from a fantasy standpoint, he has the potential to put up the number one uh, score every single week if he's actually on the field. So, um, so he's a guy who's going really high as well. The guy that I like, um, from a value standpoint is Jordan love. Jordan love is going after a bunch of other names, but I feel like, you know, what's the difference between Jordan love and, and CJ Stroud, right? But CJ Stroud's going so high. I think Jordan love has the ability to put up, um, if you told me at the end of the year that Jordan Love had scored more fantasy points or finished higher in a point per game basis than CJ Stroud, I wouldn't be surprised at all. Like that's absolutely, I, that's entirely possible. I think those two will be sort of similar, um, in terms of their fantasy styles. And so Jordan Love is a guy that you can get a lot later. And he specifically in this format, well, in this format, he's actually, again, I mentioned sharps. So he's going in the sixth round here. Um, but that's what five, six, seven, eight. So he's QB eight mm. in a lot of other formats. He's going a little bit later, but not much later. But anyway, I guess he's a name that I have circled as a guy that I'm just like going to watch the board, know where he goes in terms of ADP. And then as the draft starts to look like those quarterbacks are coming off the board, then I'll focus on Jordan love because they think that he's a really smart value pick. If I had more time, I would uh, share my whole dilemma I had with Jordan Love last year in fantasy. It did not go well for me. I had him early. The, the, the Spark Notes version of it is I had him early. My team got hurt. I had to drop somebody. I had Joe Burrow coming back. Then he got hurt, and then I wish I still kept Jordan Love. It was the whole thing. But we don't have time for that. I don't want to bore people with the, the details. Um, I'll keep it moving with a question about Nick Chubb because we know yeah. Nick Chubb has been considered from a fantasy standpoint, but also just from an NFL standpoint, one of the top five running backs yes. in football the last couple of years, if not the best running back in football. Um, obviously the fantasy lens is a little bit different just based on what type of league you're in. Right. But what are you anticipating for Nick Chubb just overall from a football standpoint? Because I understand like it's tough for a running back to come back from the type of injury he had. But then you see he, like this week, he's posting videos of himself squatting like a, a bajillion pounds. I don't even know what it was. Um, and he's one of those freaking nature athletes, almost in the same way like Adrian Peterson, when he came back from a serious injury late in his career, and was able to still have a really good season. So what is, what is your expectation, I guess, for him, knowing the freak of nature that he is, but also knowing sometimes these things can derail a, se- a career? For sure. I mean, his injury was a big injury. Yeah. Right? Like, you're not just talking about, like, one of the L's. <laughs> it's like a lot of the L's um, in that knee. <laughs> I like that, that the L's. <laughs> so, uh, so you're looking at, at – that that I think makes the question of what will he look like? Will he be the same? Will he come back? Uh, you know, on time? Will it take a longer time? We're used to saying, "Oh, somebody tore their ACL." Well, now we have a lot of examples of what that can look like when they return, but not when when you kind of like blow out a bunch of them. So I don't I. 
uh, I feel like my my answers here are a lot of I don't knows, which sucks. This is my I don't know team. <laughs> like that should be my headline, right? Um, but the thing with Nick Chubb is from a fantasy standpoint is that you have to just, it's it's about value. It's about like where the risk is worth it. And so Nick Chubb, we all know is one of the best uh, before this injury is one of the best running backs in the NFL. And whether that, you know, he's not necessarily a PPR machine, but from a pure running back standpoint, this is a talent. This is one of the best guys in the league. If you play in a standard scoring league, like it's 1980 still, then congratulations, he's been your guy for a bunch of years. But even in PPR, as a guy who doesn't get a lot of those um, passes out of the backfield, he still manages to score so many fantasy points. He's a good, consistent, high-end producer, has been. So he's going to be a guy, historically, that you have to use your first round, second round pick on. Well, now... Uh, because of the question mark attached to him, it, he's going to go in like round 10-ish uh, around a bunch of guys who you're like, uh, I don't know what that guy is. you know. <laughs> so, so in the range, he's going right outside the range of starting running backs. He's in that first tier of guys who are not starters this year that are uh, like the first guys taken after that. So you're looking at like, you know, Devin Singletary, who's projected right now to be the starter for the Giants, is going to go around before him. Um, and then you're looking at uh, he and Jerome Ford are actually going pretty close to each other uh, because, you know, for obvious reasons. Um, but in this particular ADP format, you're looking at both of them in the 10th round, actually. Okay. And so if you think, but but I've also been in a bunch of drafts this year where people are getting Nick Chubb. And then like a round or two later, they're backing him up with Jerome Ford. So strategically, I think that that's a smart strategy. If you're going to grab one, grab the other one. And then, you know, you have access to the backfield. And I don't think that that's a bad call at all, but, but you're, you're getting a ton of value. If he comes back and he looks like Nick Chubb did before, then congratulations because you got him so late. And, and I mean, around other guys, like the other guys that are going in this range are Chase Brown in Cincinnati, um, Blake Corum. Uh, for the Rams, Gus Edwards, nobody knows what's happening in that Chargers backfield. Um, and then like around later, you're looking at like uh, Ezekiel Elliott and Kendra Miller and Zach Charbonnet. So you're already looking at like number two running backs in this tier. So if he comes back and he's a high end one again, like Adrian Peterson, if he's that type of healer, then you're getting so much massive upside there. It's just, it's not a sure thing. So you, yeah. you're, you know, people are waiting on him for sure because uh, any earlier, they want to get somebody that they know is going to have a massive workload. Having a great conversation with Lindsey Rhodes here on the Dog Check Podcast this week. Again, part of the Believe Network of Podcasts and, of course, on Bally Sports Cleveland. We appreciate you guys jumping on in with us. We'll keep the bronze conversation going here for a second because uh, a couple weeks back now, I know Darius Slay, cornerback for the Eagles, made some comments on Amari Cooper, and he called him the most underrated wide receiver in football. Now, I think here in Cleveland – we kind of know that because mm -hmm. what, what's interesting is like, we've seen both sides of this, right? Like we had the Odell Beckham Jr. experience where it was like, you got the sort of, you know, over dramatic, you know, Hollywood type guy who's like going to bring all the headlines and be this big show as a wide, the diva wide receiver, if you will. And now the opposite of that is Amari Cooper. Like he pretty much just yeah. shows up and works. Granted right now, we know he's dealing with a contract situation, but do you kind of follow the same line of thinking as Darius Slay that he yeah. is maybe the most underappreciated or underrated wide receiver in football. Well, yes, I think he is a guy and I I've just finished watching the Netflix series receiver, which by the way, if, if you guys haven't watched it, I highly recommend it. It's so good and such a fun watch. But I was thinking as I was watching it, that a guy like Amari Cooper would have been a really interesting mm. guy to have followed for that series because his situation is such where he does fly under the radar but we've seen him be a high-end wide receiver, but we don't think of him in that tier. And I think that that would be an interesting guy to follow along, kind of see what that experience is like. Um, certainly last year, it would have been fascinating to follow him with all of the things that happened there in Cleveland at the quarterback position. I think that that's part of the reason that we don't think of him that way. It's just that there's so much turnover or has been for the last few years in that Cleveland offense. I mean, historically also, right? But yeah. So it's hard to really get a feel for 
like, oh, this is going to be a high end, consistently producing offense. And, and a guy where, I mean, like you saw with, you know, when Joe Flacco became the quarterback, David Njoku, and, and certainly I'm coming from a fantasy headspace, David Njoku popped is like a guy that was suddenly playable and a high end fantasy tight end. Um, And now this year people are like, well, but most of his production came with Joe Flacco and not earlier in the season when it was kind of, you know, the offense as it was originally constructed to be. Um, and so I think that there's a lot of this that happens. Um, like making a roller coaster motion with my hand for people who are just <laughs> listening. Um, I, I think that there's that. And that's that hurts Amari Cooper is just like, is he going to get is he going to get catchable balls thrown his way? Who is the quarterback? Is this person the quarterback consistently? Is this person, uh, Deshaun Watson, somebody who wants to target Amari Cooper and now we're just going to stay within the offense as opposed to changing quarterback tendencies, you know, on a week and week by week basis. I think that that has hurt Amari Cooper and it's yeah. hurt Amari Cooper's standing amongst amongst wide receivers. But again, the same point I made about Deshaun Watson is, is true from a fantasy standpoint about Amari Cooper, where like if you think that, Watson's going to stay healthy and look good this year. Then Amari Cooper's another guy that you can get massive value on because he's going to go in like that, you know, round five uh, area of, of wide receivers. He's going around like Zay flowers and Christian Kirk and T Higgins and kind of in that tier. And uh, those are outside of Zay flowers um, and a very run based offense for the most part. Um, You're looking at like wide receiver twos. Well, Amari's a wide receiver one. Like I I'm, I'm, he's a wide receiver that if, if I'm looking at wide receiver in this range, he's one that I'm drafting quite frequently because I mean, I I would much rather have a wide receiver one who has that, that kind of target share upside. Yeah. And it's funny you say that because I think, you know, the, the, or it's funny you mentioned like the roller coaster ride that was the bronze quarterback situation last year, because it did like, we noticed following the team closely Amari was the one guy who seemed to produce no matter who other the, the couple games with DTR Dorian Thompson Robinson got a little dicey like where he wasn't targeted quite as much and I think that was just like rookie quarterback wasn't really in sync with him but other than that like all these quarterbacks whether it was Deshaun whether it was Flacco even when PJ Walker was starting he was generally still like the he was the safety net he was the guy that yeah. when they were in trouble they knew I can go to Amari Cooper he's gonna make a play for me and so you're right. Like, I think he flies under the radar because of that situation from last year a little bit. But at the same time, like, he was still producing like a wide receiver one would produce. Um, mm-hmm. People just kind of forgot about Cleveland because of everything they were dealing with. So I think that's interesting. Uh, I want to go more big picture looking at the division with you. Are the yeah. Ravens still the team to beat this year coming in? Obviously, they're the reigning champions of the division, and that will mean something. But the Bengals reinsert Joe Burrow, who's healthy now. Their offense, we know, is obviously very good. Steelers making some big changes with their team as well. We know we already talked about the Browns situation. So are the Ravens still the team to beat in the AFC North? I would say yes. Um, I think if I was just off the top of my head, like rank the AFC North based on what I what I think it's likely to play out as, um, just with the information that we have available to us right now, I would go Ravens, Bengals, Browns, Steelers. Um, and that's largely, I we've talked about my questions with the Browns and how yeah. it all kind of stems from what, Deshaun Watson looks like and I just don't know the answer to that uh the Steelers I think the quarterback situation you know I don't don't know what happened with Russell Wilson but something happened with Russell Wilson (laughs) and I'm not I just I don't know uh Justin Fields I'm not convinced that Justin Fields won't be the quarterback at some point later in the season and so I don't know that any of that is actually good for the Steelers I also am not a huge and this isn't the question George Pickens is a one. I know people are excited from a fantasy standpoint. I just don't know the talk, talk about inconsistency. Talk about a roller coaster. Like he's a guy who flashes, but he has not exhibited the ability to consistently look like a high end wide receiver in all the ways that a wide receiver needs to, in terms of like winning versus man and winning versus zone and winning against the press and like his success rate and his routes and um, all of that stuff has gotten better since he's been, you know, since he was a rookie, but, but it's still more inconsistent than I would like to be a high end number one wide receiver. So I, I think that the Steelers are my four, the Ravens and Bengals. It's hard to know with the Bengals, but I just think last year was such an anomaly with the Bengals, right? Like they, Joe Burrow was hurt and, and, and looked bad as a result because he was hurt and then he was hurt and he was out. And so I, I feel like you have to assume that the Bengals can go back to what they looked like prior to Joe Burrow getting hurt. And if Joe Burrow is healthy, 
then there's every reason to expect them to be a contender again. Um, and, and the Ravens, I mean, the Ravens with Lamar and the defense, and I think that they, there's no reason to expect a step back from them. I mean, it could happen, yeah. but I don't necessarily looking at them on paper. I'm not like, Oh, they got a lot worse. Yeah. And so I think that they're the team to beat for now. Yeah, I think what's interesting about the Ravens, too, is year two of Todd Munkin's offense, Lamar a little bit more comfortable in that system. Like, that'll all be interesting to follow as well, which is why I think from a Browns lens, like, you are still a little bit worried about that team for sure. All right, I have one more question, and then I want to do, like, a rapid-fire almost uh, fantasy sort of segment to get us out of here. But uh, you brought up the the receiver show on Netflix. I want to know, I'm looking for people to validate this take that I have, that I think the version of Hard Knocks that we're getting right now with the Giants – is yeah. like the best version of Hard Knocks we've ever gotten. Because right? like, think about it, Lindsay, like you, you, you worked at the NFL Network. You were like inside a lot of these different things and trying to like find out information. We are getting like the stuff that we want. Like we're getting like yeah. what they talk about in meeting rooms when they're analyzing players that they might trade for, that they might draft. What is said in those one-on-one meetings with players at the Combine. Like that's the juicy stuff that we've wanted to see for years. And it's also the reason why I think because the Giants led so much through the cutting room floor, that we're never going to get a version of car hard knocks like this again. Cause no team's going to let all this totally. <laughs> well, and I mean, the th- some of the things that they're saying, I'm like, they said that. And yeah. now we know that that's the what cringy they said. conversation. And it's not a good, yes. like, Ugh. <laughs> but, but also, I mean, and people are going to look at that whole situation differently based on how they value analytics or like, um, have, or they, how they value the, I think the running back position has been devalued in the last few years. I don't think that it's just, uh, um, I mean, I think that's objectively true. Yeah. So whether the running back is good or not, I think one of the things that has stemmed from the fact that everybody has all this data available to them now is that it's harder to have the success that you want offensive, like it's just easier to pick up yards through the air, right? So even if you complete one, you know, of X number of passes, you're going to move the ball farther with that one completion than you are grinding it out. There's value to running the ball consistently and, and um, demoralizing a defense and all that kind of stuff. But just in terms of the objective being to put points on the board and to uh, pick up yards uh, on your way to get into the end zone, um, I think you know that you have to be able to throw the ball well in the NFL too. And so to a degree, running backs have been devalued as a result because even the best running back in the NFL doesn't subjectively give you the type of advantage um, that having a good quarterback or a good passing game gives you. Um, the Saquon in New York is the perfect example yeah. of that, right? If he's one of the best running backs in the league, and let's not even dispute that for purposes of this conversation, why do they suck? Why does it make no difference, <laughs> right? Like, it's not that valuable to have the best running back in the league unless that's a that's a, that's a luxury piece that puts you over the top. So I think that, that there are a bunch of different reasons that, that running backs have kind of come back down in the last few years. But what I thought was fascinating about the hard knocks was when they were like, well, what is our identity going to be if we don't have Saquon? And I was like, they're having a conversation about team building (laughs) from an identity standpoint in a real live front office in the year 2024. Like what? Uh, Like, unless that was a marketing you know, person who was contributing to that conversation. (laughs) I understand there are real people in the building and business reasons to care about who you're going to market and who's going to make you money and bring in the fans and all that kind of stuff. But from a football standpoint in 2024 to think you need an identity just feels like very old fashioned to me, but that is neither here nor there. I agree with you. I think that the giants, I agree. We probably won't get this version again. Um, but I think it's the most fascinating yeah. version because it's the peak behind the curtain that we haven't had. And one that is hard to fake like the hard knocks, the original hard knocks for training camp, I think has kind of become a little bit tired because of some of the things that I've said about like what Wyatt Teller said about Deshaun Watson. Like that's what happens in hard knocks is like we, it's all a bunch of tropes at this point. Like you get the rookies trying to make the roster and even, even, if you are watching them, you find yourself enamored with this person. You're like, I love that guy. He works so hard. And then you never see him again for the rest right. of the right. season. Like there's a way to build somebody up to the degree that now we have it all out of whack and perspective about what this means in the larger picture. Um, but so I don't know that there's that much that we can take away 
from hard knocks anymore. Like I'm, you know, like yeah, a I little agree. bit of personality. It's like when the lions did it, you kind of got a little bit of a peek behind the, like how they're doing things differently and how they're emphasizing grit. Right. And you got a little bit of personality of like, Oh, Dan Campbell is somebody that I do feel like I might run through a wall for. And I could see the guys buying in on that. You can see on the flip side, some of these coaches stand up there and you're like, Ooh, I don't know that that's going to work, <laughs> you know, cause I just, I'm not feeling right. it from him on the faces from the players in the audience. But this kind of off season stuff, I think I am, I'm so into roster building though. And I know that's a shock as a fantasy person. <laughs> um, but I, that's, I love that part, the putting yeah. together the puzzle of how to build a successful roster and what that would look like. And um, so the off seasons, I, I almost like the off season as much as I like the actual season. I think it's fascinating. So I agree agree with you. I think that's the best version of the hard knock. So and one of the best parts from like a media lens is when they're saying these things and you're just checking the boxes of like takes that you had over time. Like I said the exact same thing about that guy. The team is talking about like, it it gave you confirmation that you're the stuff you're saying is accurate. Like, you know what you're doing. So it's just, it's just kind of funny to see it talked about by the actual team. All right. We'll do a a quick sort of fantasy football rapid fire here to get us out of here. We'll start with the Browns one. David Njoku, you mentioned sort of the the worries about him and Deshaun's connection, but he is tight end what in your eyes this year? Oh, boy. Okay, don't have numbers in front of the let I'm going to go eight, nine. I think he's probably around tight end, like eight to ten. Okay. Uh, Browns player that you're the highest on, Browns player that you should stay away from. Uh, Browns player I'm highest on from a fantasy standpoint is Amari Cooper for sure. And the one... I would stay away from maybe other than Deshaun that you'd stay away. From. I know. Right, 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 right. I know that one. That's a sketchy conversation. It's too easy for you. I can't make it. That um, no, easy. but actually I couldn't even tell people to stay away from it because the value is such true. that That's if true. you are interested in drafting him, like that could have high end upside. Um, and it's easy to back up at this point. So I'm not going to say that. Uh, I'm not really interested in the other wide receivers, to be honest. Um, okay. Even though they're going somewhat later, I think that uh, like Jerry Judy is somebody who's been so, kind of inconsistent. I don't know that I'm, I'm, we don't know what his role is in this offense in terms of like where he falls in terms of target share and Elijah Moore. And so I think the rest of the wide receiver room is a little bit muddy and I'm probably staying away from that personally. Highest rated rookie QB. Uh, for me or in fantasy for you, uh, I am drafting a ton of Caleb Williams and part of the reason that I'm drafting a ton of him is uh the wide receiver room that he's walking into and also i should say i went to usc and so this is certainly (laughs) he's the quarterback but i mean i watch those games (laughs) and i'll be the first to raise my hand and say i'm not sitting around all day saturday watching college football i'm not a college football expert anymore like i just don't have the bandwidth for that (laughs) plus the nfl so but i do watch usc and so i think that a lot of the question marks i hear about caleb williams i feel comfortable betting that a lot of the questions are incorrect. Like I think that his talent and uh, leadership, I think he's a stud. I think he's the closest yeah. thing to Patrick Mahomes. We heard the Deshaun Watson, Patrick Mahomes comparison. And by the way, any Patrick Mahomes comparison is unfair, Agreed. but I'm going to make it with Caleb. That's who I think about when I watch Caleb Williams play or did in college was he makes throws and he gets out of jams in a way that I can only compare to Patrick Mahomes. Where you go, what did he just do and how did he do that? And so with the wide receiver room that he's walking into, I think it could be real good for him this year. Yeah, I like that answer. Uh, Highest rated non-quarterback. That's a rookie. Non okay, rookie, 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 rookie. Um, that is oh Marvin Harrison. I don't yeah. even know why that took me. Uh, why did that take me so long to think about? It's obviously <laughs> well, him. I was processing c- the question. Kind of like Amari yeah. Cooper, he flies under the radar because he's very humble. As we as we saw in Hard Knocks this week, this past week. So, <laughs> except you know what, Marvin Harrison is. Uh, if you want Marvin Harrison, you're gonna have to grab him with one of your first yeah. picks. He's yeah. going into the first round on the one two turn or start of the second round. That's where he's going in. All fantasy drafts. Your favorite sleeper player? Um, I'm going to say, and there are a few actually, but I'm going to say uh, Dontavian Wicks. Mm. I like Dontavian Wicks. I think Dontavian Wicks has has game that's a little bit under the radar. 
in an offense that I expect to be very good, the way that that offense came together in Green Bay last year at the end of the season, we all saw what they did in the playoffs. I think that I think that they are a team that could be a very good offense, and I think that he is a wide receiver. So reception perception, I'm not sure if you're familiar with that site. Matt Harmon uh, put it together. It's great if you are interested in finding wide receivers who are maybe a little bit under the radar. His whole thing is that he charts every wide receiver on all of their routes, tells you uh, their success rate on all of their routes versus man, versus zone, versus press. Uh, double teams, all that kind of stuff. And he said of Dontavian Wicks that he reminded him of charting Nico Collins his first mm. year, like in terms of the evolution over the first year, how he got better, the ways in which he got better and how different he looked at the end of his first year. Um, and I think that that is an offense with all of those young wide receivers where, you know, we don't know who's going to be the one, who's going to be the two. I think Dontavian Wicks, there's a scenario. Jaden Reed, I think, is the one or two, no matter what. I think he's one of the top two wide receivers to come out of Green Bay this year. But I think Dontavian Wicks could be the one. I he People are taking Christian Watson a lot earlier than him. You can get Dontavian Wicks in the 14th. And if you get him in the 14th and he's their wide receiver one this year, I want all of that. Make it a and you can stack him with Jordan Love, who I already told ah, you I circled as a value like quarterback. That. I like so. that. I'm making a mental note of that one. Uh, all right, two more here real quick. How okay. high should you really be drafting a kicker? There's always debate about this, but it is a starting position in your lineup. Okay. So should you take one earlier or later? No. Um, I will never crack the seal at kicker in my whole life. I refuse <laughs> to do it. Um, I, I'm, I, don't need, I don't need a high-end kicker. I just don't need it. Uh I'm 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 taking him in my last round or the second to last round, and then depending last... on how strongly I feel about you know okay. a sleeper guy. And the last one for you is it better in a snake draft to draft at the turn, like so towards the end of the round or in the middle of a snake? Right. Oh, you know what's crazy, and this is the opposite of what you just asked, but. Mock drafts and drafts that I've done this year, I hate the 1.1. I hate it. I hate making that decision. <laughs> the 1.1 runs into a bunch of like for health reasons. Or Justin Jefferson right. was that last year. He gets hurt, you know, and goodness knows like Christian McCaffrey at least has like, like he was able to stay healthy and we're all like, yeah. yay. But will that be the case again this year? I, I'm liking the builds that I'm seeing at 1.1. It's crazy. Um, but I'm liking that build. Uh, but that's not what you asked. I've ended up in the back of a lot of drafts that I've been in this year. And I don't, I don't hate those builds, but I also, I also like the middle. I, it, historically, if I just get to pick a lot of times I'll pick, I'll pick like the sixth spot because I can always get somebody, especially okay. if it's like super flex, which is two quarterbacks. You can always, you know, you're never going to miss out on a run. Like you can kind of watch it and you don't have to watch like 24 picks go by before it comes back to you. Um, where like you could go through a whole tier of players and and be like, oh, I guess I missed that position. You know, no more tight ends left for me, that kind of stuff. So I like being in the middle just to avoid that for the most part. I am uh, making a mental note of that as well. So Lindsay Rhodes, formerly of the NFL Network, now the Believe Fantasy Football Show. You can find her on X at Lindsay Rhodes. Lindsay, um, I really, really appreciate you giving us some time this week and joining us on the show. I hope we get a chance to do this again down the line. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'd love that. Appreciate your time. As always, for our listeners and viewers of the program, just want to remind you to like, follow, subscribe, and review the Dog Check Podcast wherever you get your podcasts for part of the Believe Network of Podcasts and also air weekly on Bally Sports Cleveland. You'll see me again next week, and uh, we'll be in the midst of Browns training camp. I can't wait to get back together with Woo-hoo! you guys then. Exactly. Yep. That's how we all feel here in Cleveland for sure. We're all very excited. So uh, until then, go, though, appreciate you guys tuning in. And as always, go Browns.